Chicago White Sox The Chicago White Sox are an American professional baseball team based in Chicago, Illinois. The White Sox compete in Major League Baseball, MLB, as a member club of the American League, L, Central Division. The White Sox are owned by Jerry Reinsdorf, and play their home games at Guaranteed Drake Field, located on the city's south side. They are one of two major league clubs in Chicago, the other is the Chicago Cubs, who are a member of the National League NL Central Division. One of the American League's eight charter franchises, the franchise was established as a major league baseball club in. The club was originally called the Chicago White Stockings, but this was soon shortened to Chicago White Sox. The team originally played home games at Southside Park before moving to Comiskey Park in, where they played until Guaranteed Drake Field, originally known as Comiskey Park and then known as U.S. Cellular Field, opened in 1991. The White Sox won the 1906 World Series with a defense-oriented team dubbed the Hitless Wonders, and the 1917 World Series led by Eddie Seacott, Eddie Collins, and shoeless Joe Jackson. The 1919 World Series was marred by the Black Sox scandal, in which several members of the White Sox were accused of conspiring with gamblers to fix games. In response, Major League Baseball's new commissioner Kenneth Mountain Landis banned the players from Major League Baseball for life. In 1959, Led by early win, Nellie Fox, Luis Aparicio and manager Al Lopez, the White Sox won the American League pennant. They won the Al pennant in 2005, and went on to win the World Series, led by World Series MVP Jermaine Dye, Paul Canerco, Mark Burley, catcher A.J. Bierzynski, and the first Latino manager to win the World Series, Ozzy Guillen. The White Sox originated as the Sioux City Cornhuskers of the Western League, a minor league under the parameters of the national agreement with the National League. In 1894, Charles Comiskey bought the Cornhuskers and moved them to St. Paul, Minnesota, where they became the St. Paul Saints. In 1900, with the approval of Western League President Van Johnson, Charles Comiskey moved the Saints into his hometown neighborhood of Armour Square, Chicago, where they became known as the White Stockings the former name of Chicago's National League team, the Orphans, now the Chicago Cubs. In 1901, the Western League broke the national agreement and became the new Major League American League. The very first season in the American League ended with the White Stockings Championship. However, that would be the end of the season as the World Series did not begin until 1903. The franchise, now known as the Chicago White Sox, made its first World Series appearance in 1906 beating the Crosstown Cubs in six games. The White Sox would win a third pennant and second World Series in 1917, beating the New York Giants in six games with help from stars Eddie Seacott and shoeless Joe Jackson. The Sox were heavily favored in the 1919 World Series, but lost to the Cincinnati Reds in eight games. Huge bets on the Reds fueled speculation that the series had been fixed. A criminal investigation went on in the 1920 season, and though all players were acquitted, Commissioner Kennesaw Mountain Land disbanded eight of the White Sox players for life, in what was known as the Black Sox scandal. This set the franchise back, as they did not win another pennant for 40 years. The White Sox did not finish in the upper half of the American League again until after club founder Charles Comiskey died and passed ownership of the club to his son, J. Louis Comiskey. They finished in the upper half most years between 1936 to 1946 under the leadership of manager Jimmy Dykes with star shortstop Lou Kettling, known as O'Lakes and Paines, and pitcher Ted Lyons. Appling and Lyons have their numbers 4 and 16 retired. After J. Louis Comiskey died in 1939, ownership of the club was passed down to his widow, Grace Comiskey. The club was later passed down to Grace's children Dorothy and Chuck in 1956, with Dorothy selling a majority share to a group led by Bill Veck after the 1958 season. Vec was notorious for his promotional stunts, attracting fans to Comiskey Park with the new exploding scoreboard and outfield shower. In 1961, Arthur Allen Jr. briefly owned the club before selling to his brother John Allen. From 1951 to 1967, the White Sox had their longest period of sustained success, scoring a winning record for 17 straight seasons. Known as the Go Go White Sox for their tendency to focus on speed and getting on base versus power hitting. They featured stars such as Minnie Minoso, Nellie Fox, Luis Aparicio, Billy Pierce, and Sherm Lawler. From 1957 to 1965, the Sox were managed by Al Lopez. The Sox finished in the upper half of the American League in eight of his nine seasons, including six years in the top two of the league. In 1959, 
the White Sox ended the New York Yankees' dominance over the American League, and won their first pennant since the ill-fated 1919 campaign. Despite winning Game 1 of the 1959 World Series 11-0, they fell to the Los Angeles Dodgers in six games. The late 1960s and 70s were a tumultuous time for the Sox, as they struggled to win games and attract fans. Allen and Bud Selig agreed to a handshake dealt that would give Selig control of the club and move them to Milwaukee, however, this was blocked by the American League. Selig instead bought the Seattle Pilots and moved them to Milwaukee, putting enormous pressure on the American League to place a team in Seattle. A plan was in place for the Sox to move to Seattle and for Charlie Finley to move his Oakland A's to Chicago. However, Chicago had a renewed interest in the Sox after the 1972 season, and the American League instead added the expansion Seattle Mariners. The 1972 White Sox were one of the lone successful season of this era, as Dick Allen wound up winning the American League MVP award. Some have said that Dick Allen is responsible for saving the White Sox in Chicago. Bill Vec returned as owner of the Sox in 1975, and despite not having much money, they managed to win 90 games in 1977, a team known as the Southside Hitmen. However, the team's fortunes plummeted after the 1977 season, plagued by 90 lost teams and scarred by the notorious Disco Demolition Night promotion in 1979. Bill Vec was forced to sell the team. He rejected offers from ownership groups intent on moving the club to Denver, eventually agreeing to sell the club to Ed DeBartolo who was the only prospective owner who promised to keep the Sox in Chicago. However, DeBartolo was rejected by the owners, and the club was then sold to a group headed by Jerry Reinsdorf and Eddie Einhorn. The Reinsdorf era started off well, as the Sox won their first division title in 1983, led by manager Tony La Russa and stars Carlton Fisk, Tom Pasiorek, Ron Kittle, Harold Baines, and Lamar Hoyt. During the 1986 season, La Russa was fired by announcer-turned-GM Ken Harrelson. La Russa went on to manage in six World Series, winning three, with the Oaklanders and St. Louis Cardinals, ending up in the Hall of Fame as the third-winningest manager of all time. The White Sox struggled for the rest of the 1980s, as Chicago fought to keep the Sox in town. Reinsdorf wanted to replace the aging Comiskey Park, and sought public funds to do so. When talks stalled, there was a strong offer to move the team to the Tampa. Florida area. Funding for a new ballpark was approved in an 11th hour deal by the Illinois State Legislature on June 30, 1988, with a stipulation that new park had to be built on the corner of 35th and Shields, across the street from the old ballpark, as opposed to the suburban ballpark the owners had designed. Architects offered to redesign the ballpark to a more retro feel that would fit in the city blocks around Comiskey Park, however, the ownership group was it on a 1991 open date, and so they kept the old design. In 1991, the new Comiskey Park opened. However, it would be rendered obsolete a year later with the opening of the retro-inspired Oriole Park at Camden Yards. The park, now known as Guaranteed Rate Field, underwent many renovations in the early 2000s to give it a more retro feel. The White Sox were fairly successful in the 1990s and early 2000s, with 12 winning seasons between 1990-2005. First baseman Frank Thomas became the face of the franchise, ending his career as the White Sox all-time leader in runs, doubles, home runs, total bases and walks. Other major players included Robin Ventura, Ozzie Guillen, Jack McDowell, and Bobby Thigpen. The Sox would win the West Division in 1993, and were in first place in 1994 when the season was cancelled due to the 1994 MLB strike. In 2004, Ozzy Guillen was hired as manager of his former team. After finishing second in 2004, the Sox won 99 games in the Central Division title in 2005 behind the work of stars Paul Canerco, Mark Burley, A. J. Bierzynski, Joe Creedy, and Orlando Hernandez. They started the playoffs by sweeping the defending champion Boston Red Sox in the ALDS, and then beat the Angels in five games to win their first pennant in 46 years thanks to four complete games by the White Sox rotation. The White Sox went on to sweep the Houston Astros in the 2005 World Series, giving the Sox their first world championship in 88 years. Guillen had marginal success during the rest of his tenure, with the Sox winning the Central Division title in 2008 after a one-game playoff with the Minnesota Twins. However, Guillen left the White Sox after the 2011 season and was replaced by former teammate Robin Ventura. The White Sox finished the 2015 season, their 115th in Chicago, 
with a 76-86 record, a three-game improvement over 2014. The White Sox recorded their 9,000th win in franchise history against the home team Detroit by the score of 3-2 on Monday, September 21, 2015. Ventura returned in 2016, with a young core featuring Jose Abreu, Adam Eaton, Jose Quintana, and Chris Sale. Ventura resigned after the 2016 season in which the White Sox finished 78-84. Rick Renteria, the 2016 White Sox bench coach, was promoted to the role of manager. Prior to the start of the 2017 season, the White Sox traded Chris Sale to the Boston Red Sox and Adam Eaton to the Washington Nationals for prospects including Yoan Moncada, Lucas Gilito, and Michael Kopech, signaling the beginning of a rebuilding period. During the 2017 season, the White Sox continued their rebuild when they made a blockbuster trade with their crosstown rival, the Chicago Cubs, in a swap that featured the White Sox sending pitcher Jose Quintana to the Cubs in exchange for four prospects headlined by outfielder Aloy Jimenez and pitcher Dylan Cease. This was the first trade between the White Sox and Cubes since the 2006 season. During the 2018 season, the White Sox faced a frightening situation when relief pitcher, Danny Farquhar, suffered a brain hemorrhage while he was in the dugout between innings. Farquhar remained out of action for the rest of the season and just recently got medically cleared to return to baseball despite some doctors doubting that he would make a full recovery. Also occurring during the 2018 season, the White Sox announced that the club would be the first Major League Baseball team to entirely discontinuing use of plastic straws. The move was done in ordinance with the Shed the Straw campaign by Shed Aquarium. The White Sox broke an MLB record during their 100 loss campaign of 2018, albeit not a record that was created by success. The White Sox broke the single season strikeout record in only a year after the Milwaukee Brewers broke the record in the 2017 season. On December 3, 2018, White Sox head trainer, Herm Schneider, retired after 40 seasons with the team. Schneider's new role with the team will be as an advisor on medical issues pertaining to free agency, the amateur draft, and player acquisition. Schneider will also continue to be a resource for the White Sox training department including both the major and minor league levels. In the late 1980s, the franchise threatened to relocate to Tampa Bay, as did the San Francisco Giants, but frantic lobbying on the part of the Illinois Governor James R. Thompson and state legislature resulted in approval by one vote, of public funding for a new stadium. Designed primarily as a baseball stadium, as opposed to a multi-purpose stadium, New Comiskey Park, redubbed U.S. Cellular Field in 2003 and Guaranteed Rate Field in 2016, was built in a 1960s style similar to Dodger Stadium and Kauffman Stadium. It opened into positive reviews, many praised its wide open concourses, excellent sight lines, and natural grass, unlike other stadiums of the era such as Rogers Center in Toronto. The park's inaugural season drew 2,934,154 fans, at the time, an all-time attendance record for any Chicago baseball team. In recent years, money accrued from the sale of naming rights to U.S. Cellular has been allocated for renovations to make the park more aesthetically appealing and fan-friendly. Notable renovations of early phases included reorientation of the bullpens parallel to the field of play, thus decreasing slightly the formerly symmetrical dimensions of the outfield, filling seats and up to and shortening the outfield wall, ballooning foul line seat sections out toward the field of play, creating a new multi-tiered batter's eye, allowing fans to see out through one-way screens from the center field vantage point, and complete with concession stand and bar-style seating on its fan deck, renovating all concourse areas with brick historic murals, and new concession stand ornaments to establish a more A-friendly feel. The stadium's steel and concrete was repainted dark gray and black. The scoreboard Jumbotron was also replaced with a new Mitsubishi Diamond Vision HDTV giant screen. More recently, the top quarter of the upper deck was removed in and a black wrought metal roof was placed over it, covering all but the first eight rows of seats. This decreased seating capacity from 47,098 to 40,615. 2005 also saw the introduction of the scout seats, redesignating, and reupholstering, 200 lower deck seats behind home plate as an exclusive area, with seat side wait staff and a complete restaurant located underneath the concourse. The most significant structural addition besides the new roof was a Zephu Nimentals deck, a multi tiered structure on the left field concourse containing batting cages, a small T ball field, speed pitch and several other child-themed activities intended to entertain and educate young fans with the help of coaching staff from the Chicago Bulls-Sox Training Academy.
This structure was used during the 2005 playoffs by ESPN and Fox Broadcasting Company as a broadcasting platform. Designed as a seven-phase plan, the renovations were completed before the season with the seventh and final phase. The most visible renovation in this final phase was replacing the original blue seats with green seats. The upper deck already had new green seats, put in before the beginning of the 2006 season. Beginning with the season a new luxury seating section was added in the former press box. This section has amenities similar to those of the scout seats section. After the 2007 season the ballpark continued renovation projects despite that the seven-phase plan was complete. The St. Saint Paul Saints first played their games at Lexington Park. When they moved to Chicago's Armour Square neighborhood, they began play at the Southside Park. Previously a cricket ground, the park was located on the north side of 39th Street, now called Pershing Road, between South Wentworth and South Princeton Avenues. Its massive dimensions yielded few home runs, which was to the advantage of the White Sox hitless wonders teams of the early 20th century. After the 1909 season, the Sox moved five blocks to the north to play in the new Comiskey Park, while the 39th Street grounds became the home of the Chicago American Giants of the Negro Leagues. Built as the baseball palace of the world, it originally held 28,000 seats and eventually grew to hold over 50,000. It became known for its many odd features, such as the outdoor shower and the exploding scoreboard. When it closed after the 1990 season, it was the oldest ballpark still in Major League Baseball. The White Sox have held spring training in. On November 19, 2007, the cities of Glendale, Arizona, and Phoenix, Arizona broke ground on the Cactus League's newest spring training facility. Camelback Ranch, the $76 million two team facility, is the new home of both the White Sox and the Los Angeles Dodgers for their spring training programs. Aside from state of the art baseball facilities at the 10,000 seat stadium, the location includes residential, restaurant, and retail development, a four star hotel, and 18 hole golf course. Other amenities include of major and minor league clubhouses for the two teams four major league practice fields and eight minor league practice fields, two practice infields and parking to accommodate 5,000 vehicles. Over the years the White Sox have become noted for many of their uniform innovations and changes. In 1960, the White Sox became the first team in the major sports to put players' last names on jerseys. In 1912 the White Sox debuted a large S in a Roman-style font with a small O inside the top loop of the S and a small X inside the bottom loop. This is the logo associated with the 1917 World Series championship team and the 1919 Black Sox. With a couple of brief interruptions, the dark blue logo with the large S lasted through 1938, but continued in a modified block style into the 1940s. Through the 1940s, the White Sox team colors were primarily navy blue trimmed with red. The White Sox logo in the 1950s and 1960s, actually beginning in the 1949 season, was the word Sox in an old English font, diagonally arranged, with the S larger than the other two letters. From 1949 through 1963, the primary color was black, trimmed with red after 1951. The old English Sox in black lettering is the logo associated with the Go-Go Sox era. In 1964, the primary color went back to navy blue, and the road uniforms changed from gray to pale blue. In 1971, the team's primary color changed from royal blue to red, with the color of their pinstripes and caps changing to red. The 1971-1975 uniform included red socks. In 1976 the team's uniforms changed again. The team's primary color changed back from red to navy. The team based their uniforms on a style worn in the early days of the franchise, with white jerseys worn at home, blue on the road. The team brought back white socks for the last time in team history. The socks featured a different stripe pattern every year. The team also had the option to wear blue or white pants with either jersey. Additionally, the team's socks logo was changed to a modern looking socks in a bold font, with Chicago written across the jersey. Finally, the team's logo featured a silhouette of a batter over the word socks. The new uniforms also featured collars and were designed to be worn untucked, both unprecedented. Yet by far the most unusual wrinkle was the option to wear shorts, which the White Sox did for the first game of a doubleheader against the Kansas City Royals in 1976. The Hollywood stars of the Pacific Coast League had previously tried the same concept, it was also poorly received. Apart from aesthetic issues, as a practical matter shorts are not conducive to sliding, due to the likelihood of significant abrasions. 
Sports. Upon taking over the team in 1980 new owners Eddie Einhorn and Jerry Reinsdorf announced a contest where fans were invited to create new uniforms for the White Sox. The winning entry was submitted by a fan where the word Sox was written across the front of the jersey, in the same font as a cap, inside of a large blue stripe trimmed with red. The red and blue stripes were also on the sleeves, and the road jerseys were gray to the home white dot in those jerseys the White Sox won 99 games in the AL West Championship in 1983 the best record in the majors. After five years those uniforms were retired and replaced with a more basic uniform which had white socks written across the front in script, with Chicago on the front of the road jersey. The cap logo was also changed to a cursive C, although the batter logo was retained for several years. For a mid-season 1990 game at Comiskey Park the White Sox appeared once in a uniform based on that of the 1917 White Sox. The White Sox then switched their regular uniform style once more. In September, for the final series at Old Comiskey Park, the Old English Sox logo, a slightly simplified version of the 1949-63 logo, was restored, and the new uniform also had the black pinstripes restored. The team's primary color changed back to black, this time with silver trim. The team also introduced a new Sox logo, a white silhouette of a Sox centered inside a white outline of a baseball diamond which appeared as a sleeve patch on the away and alternate uniforms until 2011 when the patch was switched with the primary logo on the away uniform dot with minor modifications, i.e., occasionally wearing vests, black game jerseys, the White Sox have used this style ever since. During the 2012 and 2013 seasons, the White Sox wore their throwback uniforms at home every Sunday, starting with the 1972 red pinstripe throwback jersey sworn during the 2012 season followed by the 1981-86 uniforms the next season. In the 2014 season, the winning ugly throwbacks were promoted to full-time alternate status, and is now worn at home on Sundays. In one game during the 2014 season, the White Sox paired their throwbacks with a cap featuring the batter logo instead of the word Mark Sox, this is currently their batting practice cap prior to games in the throwback uniforms. The White Sox were originally known as the White Stockings, a reference to the original name of the Chicago Cubs. To fit the name in headlines, local newspapers such as the Chicago Tribune abbreviated the name alternatively to Stocks and Sox. Charles Comiskey would officially adopt the White Sox nickname in the club's first years, making them the first team to officially use the Sox name. The Chicago White Sox are most prominently nicknamed the Southsiders, based on their particular district within Chicago. Other nicknames include the synonymous Pale House, the Chi Sox, a combination of Chicago and Sox, used mostly by the national media to differentiate them between the Boston Red Sox, Bo Sox, and the Good Guys, a reference to the team's one-time motto Good Guys Wear Black, coined by broadcaster Ken Harrelson. Most fans in Chicago media refer to the team as simply the Sox. The Spanish-language media sometimes refer to the team as Medias Blancas for White Sox. Several White Sox teams have received nicknames over the years. From 1961 until 1991, lifelong Chicago resident Andrew Rosedielski performed as the unofficial yet popular mascot Andy the Clown for the White Sox at the original Comiskey Park. Known for his elongated Come On You White Sox battle cry, Andy got his start after a group of friends invited him to a Sox game in 1960, where he decided to wear his clown costume and entertain fans in his section. That response was so positive that when he won free 1961 season tickets, he decided to wear his costume to all games. Comiskey Park Ushers eventually offered free admission to Rose Dielski. Starting in 1981, the new ownership group by Jerry Reinsdorf introduced a twosome, called Ribby and Rhubarb, as the official team mascots, and banned Rose Dielski from performing in the lower seating level. Ribby and Rhubarb were very unpopular, as they were seen as an attempt to get rid of the beloved Andy the Clown. In 1988, the Sox got rid of Ribby and Rhubarb, and Andy the Clown was not permitted to perform in New Comiskey Park when it opened in 1991. In the early 1990s, the White Sox had a cartoon mascot named Waldo the White Sox Wolf that advertised the silver and black pack, the Team Kids Club half time. The team's current mascot, South Paul, was introduced in 2004 to attract young fans. Nancy Faust became the White Sox organist in 1970, a position she would hold for 40 years. She was one of the first ballpark organists to play pop music, and became known for her songs playing on the names of opposing players, such as Iron Butterflies in a Gotta Vida for Pete and Cabilia. 
Her many years with the White Sox established her as one of the last great stadium organists. Since 2011, Lori Moreland has served as the White Sox organist. Similar to the Boston Red Sox with Sweet Caroline, and two songs named Tessie, and the New York Yankees with Theme from New York, New York, several songs have become associated with the White Sox over the years. They include The Chicago Cubs are the crosstown rivals of the White Sox, a rivalry that some made fun of prior to the White Sox's 2005 title because both of them had extremely long championship droughts. The nature of the rivalry is unique, with the exception of the 1906 World Series, in which the White Sox upset the favored Cubs, the teams never met in an official game until, when interleague play was introduced. In the intervening time, the two teams sometimes met for exhibition games. The White Sox currently lead the regular season series 48-39, winning the last four seasons in a row. The BP Crosstown Cup was introduced in 2010 and the White Sox won the first three seasons, 2010-2012, until the Cubs first won the Cup in 2013 by sweeping the season series. The White Sox won the Cup the next season and retained the Cup the following two years. Series was a tie, Cup remains with defending team in the event of the tie. The Cubs took back the Cup in 2017. There have been two series sweeps since interleague play began both by the Cubs, 1998 and 2013. An example of this volatile rivalry is the game play between the White Sox and the Chicago Cubs at U.S. Cellular Field on May 20. White Sox catcher A.J. Bierzynski was running home on a sacrifice fly by center fielder Brian Anderson and smashed into Cubs catcher Michael Barrett, who was blocking home plate. Bierzynski lost his helmet in the collision, and slapped the plate as he rose. Barrett stopped him and, after exchanging a few words, punched Bierzynski in the face, causing a melee to ensue. Brian Anderson and Cubs first baseman John Mabry got involved in a separate confrontation, although it was later determined that Mabry was attempting to be a peacemaker. After 10 minutes of conferring following the fight, the umpires ejected Bierzynski, Barrett, Anderson, and Mabry. As Bierzynski entered his dugout, he pumped his arms, causing the sold-out crowd at U.S. Cellular Field to erupt in cheers. When play resumed, White Sox second baseman Tadahito Iguchi blasted a grand slam to put the White Sox up 5-0 on their way to a 7-0 win over their crosstown rivals. While there are other major league cities and metropolitan areas in which two teams coexist, all of the others feature at least one team which began playing there in or later, whereas the White Sox and Cubs have been competing for their city's fans since 1901. The White Sox enjoy healthy divisional rivalries. The Detroit Tigers are one of Chicago's primary rivals, and the cities of Chicago and Detroit share rivalries in other sports as well, such as the Bulls-Pistons rivalry, Black Hawks-Red Wings rivalry and the Bears-Lions rivalry. The rivalry has had its fair share of fights as well. The two teams are separated by a small under-five-hour drive, leading to fans of both teams showing up in large numbers at each other's home stadiums. The teams have also got into a number of brawls, the most famous of which occurred in 2000 along with Binocular Gate in 2014. In 2016, Al Avila, the GM of the Tigers, led his own son, catcher Alex Avila, leave the Tigers to sign with the White Sox. The Minnesota Twins are high profile rivals as well, with fans of both teams showing up to Comiskey Park and Target Field in healthy numbers. The White Sox and Twins also played in a one game playoff in 2008. The White Sox would win the game 1-0 in the division. Between 2000 and 2010, the teams combined for nine AL Central titles, and although the Twins won six times to the White Sox three, the White Sox won the only World Series of the two in this time, 2005. Former All-Star catcher AJ Bierzynski played for both teams and left Minnesota in 2003 and joined the Sox in 2005. He received boost on his first visit back to Minnesota. Chicago has another rivalry with the Cleveland Indians. The rivalry first started upon the creation of the Al Central in 1994. On July 15, 1994, an umpire confiscated Albert Bell's bat, presuming that it was corked. They put it in the umpire's room at Comiskey Park. However, Indians pitcher Jason Grimsley climbed through the ceiling from the visitors' clubhouse and stole the bat. The theft was discovered and Bell was suspended. Grimsley later owned up to the theft. Bell further inflamed matters by spurning the Indians and signing a large free agent contract with the White Sox in 1997. In 2005, during the White Sox World Series chase, the Indians cut down the Sox lead in the division from 14 games to 3 heading into the final weekend of the season with the Sox at 96-63 and the Tribe at 93-66. 
the White Sox swept the Indians and knocked them bot out of the division race and wild card hunt with mostly backup players. A historical regional rival was the St. Louis Browns. Through the 1953 season, the two teams were located fairly close to each other, including the 1901 season when the Browns were the Milwaukee Brewers, and could have been seen as the American League equivalent of the Cardinals-Cubs rivalry, being that Chicago and St. Louis had for years been connected by the same highway, U.S. Route 66 and now Interstate 55. The rivalry has been somewhat revived at times in the past, involving the Browns' current identity, the Baltimore Orioles, most notably in 1983. The current Milwaukee Brewers franchise were arguably the White Sox main and biggest rival, due to the proximity of the two cities, resulting in large numbers of White Sox fans who would regularly be in attendance at the Brewers' former home Milwaukee County Stadium, and with the teams competing in the same American League division for the 1970 and 1971 seasons and then again from 1994 to 1997. The rivalry has since cooled off however, when the Brewers moved to the National League in 1998. The White Sox did not sell exclusive rights for radio broadcasts from radio's inception until 1944, instead having local stations share rights for games, and after WGN, 720, was forced to abdicate their rights to the team in the 1943 after 16 seasons due to children's programming commitments from their network, Mutual. The White Sox first granted exclusive rights in 1944, and would bounce between stations until 1952 when the White Sox started having a games broadcast on WCFL, 1000. Throughout this period of instability, one thing remained constant, the White Sox play-by-play -play announcer, Bob Elson. Known as the Commander, Elson was the voice of the Sox from 1929 until his departure from the club in 1970. In 1979, he was the recipient of the Ford Frick Award, and his profile is permanently on display in the National Baseball Hall of Fame. After the 1966 season, radio rights shifted from WCFL to Mac, 670. An NBC-owned and operated station until 1988 when Westinghouse Broadcasting purchased it after NBC's withdrawal from radio, it was the home of the Sox until the 1996 season, outside of a team nader in the early 70s where it was forced to broker time on suburban law Grange's DAC, 1300, and Evanston's WEWFM, 105.1 to have their play-by-play -play air in some form, though well transmitted from the John Hancock Center, FM radio was not established as a band for sports play-by-play -play at the time, and a one-season contract on WBBM, 780, in 1981. After Elson's retirement in 1970, Harry Carey began his tenure as the voice of the White Sox, on radio as well as on television. Although best remembered as a broadcaster for the rival Cubs, Carey was very popular with White Sox fans. Pining for a cold one during broadcast stop Carey would often broadcast from the stands, sitting at a table set up amidst the bleachers. It became a badge of honor among Sox fans to buy Harry a beer. By games end you'd see a large stack of empty beer cups beside his microphone. This only endeared him to fans that much more. In fact, it was with the Sox that he started his tradition of leading the fans in the singing of Take Me Out to the Ball Game. Carey, alongside color analyst Jimmy Pearsell, was never afraid to criticize the Sox which angered numerous Sox managers and players, notably Bill Melton and Chuck Tanner. He left to succeed Jack Brickhouse as the voice of the Cubs in 1981, where he became a national icon. The White Sox shifted through several announcers in the 1980s, before hiring John Rooney as play-by-play -play announcer in 1989. In 1992, he was paired with color announcer Ed Farmer. In 14 seasons together, the duo became a highly celebrated announcing team, even being ranked by USA Today as the top broadcasting team in the American League. Starting with Rooney and Farmer's fifth season together, Sox games returned to the 1000 AM frequency for the first time in 30 years, now the ESPN-owned and operated station WMVP. The last game on WMVP was Game 4 of the 2005 World Series, with the White Sox clinching their first World Series title in 88 years. That also was Rooney's last game with the Sox, as he left to join the radio broadcast team of the St. Louis Cardinals. In 2006, radio broadcasts returned to 670, this time on the sports radio station WSCR owned by CBS Radio. WSCR took over the 670 frequency in August 2000 as part of a number of shifts among CBS Radio properties to meet market ownership caps. Ed Farmer became the play-by-play -play man after Rooney left, 
Joined in the booth by Chris Singleton from 2006 to 2007 and then Steve Stone in 2008. In 2009, Darren Jackson became the color announcer for White Sox Radio, where he remains today. Farmer and Jackson were joined by pre-game slash post-game host Chris Rogney. The Chicago White Sox Radio Network currently has 18 affiliates in three states. As of recently, White Sox games are also broadcast in Spanish with play-by-play -play announcer Hector Molina joined in the booth by Billy Russo. Formerly broadcasting on ESPN Deportes Radio Viola, games are now broadcast in Spanish and WRTO, 1200. In the 2016 season, the play-by-play -play rights shifted to Cumulus Media's WLS, 890, under a five-year deal. When WSCR acquired the rights to Cubs games of Terra one year period on WBBM. However, by all counts, the deal was a disaster for the White Sox, as WLS's declining conservative talk format, associated ratings, and management slash personnel issues, including said hosts barely promoting the team and its games, and a signal that is weak in the northern suburbs and into Wisconsin, was not a good fit for the team. Cumulus also had voluminous financial issues, and by the start of 2018, looked to both file Chapter 11 bankruptcy and get out of the play-by-play -play business entirely, both with local teams and nationally through their Westwood 1-NFL deal. The White Sox and Tribune Broadcasting then announced a three-year deal for WGN Radio to become the White Sox flagship as of February 14, 2018, just in time for spring training. Ed Farmer and Darren Jackson will continue to be on play-by-play with Andy Mazur taking over pre-game slash post-game duties. White Sox games appeared sporadically on television throughout the first half of the 20th century, most commonly announced by Jack Brickhouse on WGN-TV Channel 9. Starting in 1968, Jack Drees took play-by-play -play duties as the Sox were broadcast on WFLD, Channel 32. After 1972, Harry Caray, joined by Jimmy Pearsall in 1977, began double duty as a TV and radio announcer for the Sox, as broadcasts were moved to Channel 44, WSNS-TV, from 1972 to 1980, followed by one year on WGN-TV. Don Drysdale became the play-by-play -play announcer in 1982, as the White Sox began splitting their broadcasts between WFLD and the new regional cable television network, Sports Vision. Ahead of its time, Sports Vision had a chance to gain huge profits for the Sox. However, few people would subscribe to the channel after being used to free-to-air broadcasts for many years, along with Sports Vision being stunted by the city of Chicago's wiring for cable television taking much longer than many markets because of it being an area where over-the-air subscription services were still more popular, resulting in the franchise losing around $300,000 a month. While this was going on, every Cubs game was on WGN with Harry Caray becoming the national icon he never was with the White Sox stopped the relatively easy near national access to Cubs games versus Sox games in this era, combined with the popularity of Caray and the Cubs being owned by the Tribune Company, is said by some to be the main cause of the Cubs' advantage in popularity over the Sox. Three major changes to White Sox broadcasting happened each year from 1989 to 1991. In 1989 with the city finally fully wired for cable service, Sports Vision was replaced by Sports Channel Chicago, itself eventually turning into Fox Sports Net Chicago, which varied over its early years as a premium sports service and basic cable channel. In 1990, over-the-air broadcasts shifted back to WGN. And in 1991, Ken Harrelson became the play-by-play -play announcer of the White Sox. One of the most polarizing figures in baseball, Hawk has been both adored and scorned for his emotive announcing style. His history of calling out umpires has earned him reprimands from the commissioner's office, and he has been said to be the most biased announcer in baseball. However, Harrelson has said that he is proud of being the biggest homer in baseball, saying that he is a White Sox fan like his viewers. The team moved from FSN Chicago to the newly launched NBC Sports Chicago in March 2005 as Jerry Reinsdorf looked to control the rights for his team rather than sell rights to another party, Reinsdorf holds a 40% interest in the network, with 20% of that interest directly owned by the White Sox Corporation. Currently, White Sox local television broadcasts are split between two channels, the majority of games are broadcast on cable by NBC Sports Chicago, and remaining games are produced by WGN Sports and are broadcast locally on WGN-TV. WGN games are also occasionally picked up by local stations in Illinois, Iowa, and Indiana. In the past, 
WGN games were broadcast nationally on the WGN America Superstation, but those broadcasts ended after the 2014 season as WGN America began its transition to a standard cable network. WGN Sports produced White Sox games not carried by WGN TV were carried by Shoe TV, Channel 26, until the 2015 season, when they moved to my networked station WPWR, Channel 50. That arrangement ended on September 1, 2016 when WGN became an independent station. Prior to 2016, the announcers were the same no matter where the games were broadcast, Harrelson provided play-by-play and Steve Stone provided color analysis since 2009. Games that are broadcast on NBC Sports Chicago feature pre-game and post-game shows, hosted by Chuck Garfane with analysis from Bill Melton and occasionally Frank Thomas. In 2016, the team announced an official split of the play-by-play duties, with Harrelson calling road games in the Crosstown series and Jason Benetti calling home games. In 2017, the team announced that the 2018 season will be Harrelson's final in the booth. He will call 20 games over the course of the season, after which Benetti will take over full time play by play duties. Note American League Championship Series began in 1969. The White Sox have retired a total of 12 jersey numbers, 11 worn by former White Sox and number 42 in honor of Jackie Robinson. Luis Aparicio's number 11 was issued at his request for the 2010 and 2011 seasons for 11-time Gold Glove winner shortstop Omar Vizquel, because number 13 was used by manager Ozzy Guillen. Vizquel, like Aparicio and Guillen, play edge shortstop and all share a common Venezuelan heritage. Also, Harold Baines had his number 3 retired in 1989, it has since been unretired three times in each of his subsequent returns. Silver Chalice is a digital and media investment subsidiary of the White Sox with Brooks Boyers as CEO. Silver Chalice was co-founded by Jerry Reinsdorf, White Sox executive Brooks Boyer, Jason Coyle and John Burris in 2009. Chalice has since partnered with IMG on Campus Insiders, a college sports digital channel. The company also invested in 120 Sports, a digital sports channel, that launched in June 2016. These efforts have since been merged with Sinclair Broadcasting Group's American Sports Network into the new multi-platform network stadium as of September 2017. Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.